Hello and welcome to the Pax Britannica podcast. My name is Chris Flynn and I'm the host of the Number 10 podcast. Our podcast looks at the lives and times of British Prime Ministers, their elections and the big events during their tenure. Thatcher's fight with the unions, Robert Peel's formation of the police force and coming up soon in our recording schedule, Robert Walpole and the first economic crash of British history known as the South Sea Bubble. We're currently looking at the year 1702 and the foundations of political parties and importantly the act of union that created Great Britain. We also feature topical political chats such as our recent two-part episode on Boris Johnson versus Jeremy Corbyn. The number 10 podcast is available on all good podcasting apps. And now for the main event, your regularly scheduled episode of Pax Britannica. Welcome to Pax Britannica, episode 28, The Useless Parliament. Welcome back to Pax Britannica. Last time, we toured the domains of the freshly proclaimed Charles I. We heard how vast and vastly different his realms were. We also covered the events of the 1622 Virginia Massacre, which spurred the dissolution of the Virginia Company and the settlement's reformation into a crown colony. We left off with Charles freshly married to Princess Henrietta Maria of France, as the king is on the brink of summoning that great English institution, Parliament. This presents the perfect opportunity to explain how members of Parliament were actually elected. I touched on this slightly last time when discussing the forms of local government, and how local notables, from the high aristocracy down, were co-opted into the system. So, firstly, the English Houses of Parliament, just like the British Houses of Parliament today, is divided into two houses, the Upper House, the House of Lords, and the Lower House, the House of Commons. At this stage in Charles's reign, the House of Lords was made up of nobles and bishops, with their numbers swelled from the graft of the Duke of Buckingham. Their role was to receive petitions, act as a court of appeal, draft bills to be presented to the Lower House, while receiving and amending, and eventually approving, drafts of bills from the Commons. Notably, one of their ancient, but relatively unused abilities, had been hauled out of the garage of state, dusted off, and put to use recently. That of impeachment. Squabbles at court had spilled over into Parliament, with first Sir Francis Bacon, and then the Earl of Middlesex, facing parliamentary impeachment during the later years of James's reign. The worst punishment was headed off by the king, who knew when to cut ties to a minister while also cushioning their fall, and he had warned his son and his favourite of the danger of getting Parliament involved in politics. This, dear listeners, is what we call foreshadowing. The lower house, the House of Commons, was made up of MPs chosen from their districts. The franchise, who could actually vote, varied from place to place, It could be incredibly narrow, with strict property requirements, or relatively broad, with all householders invited to make their mark. Inflation had broadened the franchise substantially, especially in the countryside, where the requirement to hold land, valued at more than 40 shillings, was much more attainable than it had been in the previous decades or even centuries, especially as smaller plots were bought up and consolidated. There was no residency requirement to be nominated, although knights of the shire were rarely chosen if they didn't hold sizeable estates in their constituencies. The actual voting was a fairly basic affair, with usually only two candidates standing, and their electability measured by their reputation and social standing. If there were more than two candidates, then the sheriff got involved, 
excess candidates would be pressured to withdraw, or the sheriff would make an executive decision and judge their popularity. In the worst possible case, there would be a poll. A poll in my parliamentary democracy? Well, it's more likely than you think, and that likelihood increased as the century progressed. But don't get too ahead of yourself imagining a burgeoning English democracy in action. There were still plenty of candidates appointed at the whim of wealthy elites, at the urging of the government. Once a parliament gathered in London, a flaw immediately became apparent. The chamber didn't have enough space for every member of parliament. Luckily, there was never every member of parliament in attendance, The same issue that plagued the other positions of honour and influence, such as the justices of the peace or members of county militias, hit Parliament too, as more work-shy MPs just stayed at home. Others went halfway, using the excuse to go to London, but avoiding those complicated speeches, or committees, or votes, or anything really that resembles a job so they rarely appear in the historical record. As we've seen before, one of the major jurisdictions where the Lords were subject to the Commons, in Parliament at least, was on taxation. Taxation, like subsidies and trade duties, were decided by the Commons. The Commons held the purse strings of England, and they would only loosen their grip in return for their grievances being heard. All of this brings us to Charles's first Parliament. It met in June of 1625, even as London was facing an outbreak of the Black Death. Charles, freshly married to Henrietta Maria, opened the session with a speech to both houses which plainly set out how he was different to his father, as well as laying out very clearly what he expected from his Parliament. Quote, I thank God that the business to be treated on at this time is of such a nature that it needs no eloquence to set it forth, for I am neither able to do it, neither doth it stand with my nature to spend much time in words. He goes on to describe the preparations for war which were already under way, reminding the houses that this was partly their doing. Quote, My lords and gentlemen, I hope you do remember that you were pleased to employ me to advise my father to break off those two treaties that were on foot. He continues, I pray you remember that this being my first action, and begun by your advice and entreaty, what a great dishonour it were to you and me if this action so begun should fail for that assistance you are able to give me. Essentially, Charles opens the 1625 Parliament by saying that he isn't one for grand public speeches or writings, in great contrast to his royal father, and that Parliament had committed itself to this war, and so had bloody well better fund it. Each of these statements were problematic, or would soon prove to be. Hang on, you might be thinking, when did war break out? The Anglo-Spanish War, sometimes called the Second Anglo-Spanish War to differentiate it from the Elizabethan conflict, began in 1625, after Charles dispatched embassies to the Dutch, the Danes, and several Italian states to secure an alliance against the Spanish. At this point, the Thirty Years' War had been burning for seven years, and the Dutch had been committed to for six of them. The Danes became involved in 1625, with King Christian IV motivated by his own strategic concerns, and encouraged by English and French subsidies and promises of aid. The French, despite having married their princess to Charles, were hesitant to commit to joining a Protestant coalition or leading the charge against the Habsburgs. Nevertheless, Cardinal Richelieu promised that, once Britain led the way, they would follow. Now watch this space. Also, part of the marriage treaty between England and France 
was that a fleet of English ships would be seconded to the French for their aid. Keep this in mind. Aside from avenging his personal honour, Charles's desire for war with the Habsburgs was based on a deathbed promise he had made to James to protect and restore his sister, who was of course married to the Palatine, Frederick, or Friedrich. Charles had seen, and participated in, Parliament's Patriot Coalition. He had heard the vitriol spewed at the Spanish, the sympathies expressed for the Palatine, and other Protestants suffering under Catholic tyranny. Elizabeth's war with Spain had become legendary, an example of how a Protestant kingdom should act. So, perhaps Charles was not wholly naive to expect that he would have Parliament's full financial support for a war to restore the Palatinate. Parliament, however, was not sure. They had questions, and many of them will be familiar to us. What will this war look like? How will it be fought, on land or sea? What is the priority, restoring Friedrich to his lands, aiding the Dutch, or giving the Spanish a bloody nose? And, if it was to be a primarily naval war, who will lead it? Because there was one person, both commons and lords, did not want leading a campaign, who also happened to be the Lord Admiral, and would, naturally, have responsibility for any marine expedition. I am, of course, speaking of the Duke of Buckingham. Buckingham was not simply unpopular, although he certainly was that, He was also incompetent, or at the very least unproven, in military matters. He had never been in battle, on land or sea, and his critics in Parliament sneered that their Lord Admiral had been violently seasick on his trip to and from Madrid. Nevertheless, the Commons voted two subsidies as a free gift to mark Charles' secession, which the king used to pay for the war preparations that were already underway. Further, funding for the war would be discussed after Parliament reconvened at Oxford on the 1st of August. The plague showed no sign of retreating from London, and so Parliament would retreat from it. Charles was genuinely surprised at Parliament's unwillingness and the paltry sum he had been granted, The 1624 Parliament, which he had wished to recall, but which had, by tradition, been dissolved on the death of James, had been widely believed to be on the verge of voting a minimum of three subsidies. Charles expected three at a minimum, yet here he was with a measly two. He also didn't understand how his subjects already had grievances. He'd only been king for a few months. This is an odd perspective for him to take, considering he appeared to see his reign as a continuation of that of his father's. He kept all the same ministers and all the same policies, except for the war. These were the grievances. Now aside from discussing the war, which Charles could perhaps understand if not enjoy, the Commons began straying into two fields that he was not prepared to tolerate. Royal finances, which included an investigation into the Duke of Buckingham, and religion. Bonjour, comment ça va? Happy New Year, everyone. Yes, it's that time of the year when people make resolutions. They want to read more, exercise more, or learn a new language. Clearly, I've chosen the latter. And I have Babbel, the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions, to help me. So, it's French for me in 2022, but like all of you, my schedule is already full. No problem. Babbel is fun, engaging, and its bite-sized language lessons, about 15 minutes, are for real-world use. In other words, it's doable and practical, my two favorite things. And you know that you're getting the best with Babbel, as it was created by over 100 language experts with proven effectiveness, and its speech recognition technology will help improve your pronunciation and accent. And there are 14 languages to choose from. As I am a child at heart, I like Babbel's podcasts, games, stories, and videos, not to mention 
the live classes. But best of all, to put you at ease, there is a 20-day money-back guarantee. All reward, no risk. Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. That's six months for the price of three. Just go to Babbel.com and use promo code Recorded History. That's B A B B E L dot com code Recorded History. Babel language for life. One of Parliament's most famous financial bestowments is that of tonnage and poundage, a customs duty on imports and exports. This had been granted to monarchs for centuries and had been granted for life for more than 200 years. However, the eternally unpopular impositions reared their head once again. Fears that Charles would continue to collect these, in Parliament's eyes, illegal sums, meant that the Commons only voted to give Charles the right to collect tonnage and poundage for a single year, not for life, pending a review of royal finances. However, the Act would fail to pass the Lords before other events overtook it. In matters of religion, Parliament had grown increasingly concerned about the prevalence of Catholics, and suspected Catholics, at court and in positions of authority. This, in turn, spurred questions of Charles's religious feelings. After all, he had been determined to marry a Catholic princess, and once that had failed, he married another. Worse, by the time that Parliament reconvened in Oxford, news had arrived that did nothing to help grow trust in Charles's Protestantism, nor Buckingham's popularity. The English fleet loaned to France, which had been intended for use against the Spanish and their allies, had been used by Cardinal Richelieu in an attack on French Protestant rebels. The Huguenots had captured the Ile de Ré and the city of La Rochelle on the western coast of France. Seven English ships, though mostly crewed by Frenchmen, had attacked the Huguenot positions and fleet. This was completely against the terms of the treaty, secret clauses or no. That mattered little to the sceptics in Parliament, and only added to their worries when they focused on a single man. Richard Montague. Montague had been the subject of a complaint at the previous year's Parliament for publishing a new gag for an old goose. This controversial tract made the argument that the Church of England and the Church of Rome were not actually that different, and that this was a good thing. For reformists, the Calvinists, and the Presbyterian allies in Parliament, this was appalling. James had supported Montague, and that king's Protestantism was beyond a doubt, despite his love of bishops. However, when Montague once again resurfaced in parliamentary debates, Charles intervened, appointing Montague as his personal chaplain and declaring that he had, quote, taken the business into his own hands, end quote. In his royal opinion, Parliament should leave it there and get back to the business of voting him more money. The Commons did no such thing and instead drafted a petition complaining that Charles's actions were, quote, animating the Popish party, end quote. Charles would have none of it. This Parliament should have welcomed him to the throne and rubber-stamped his supply and his war plans. Instead, they had had the temerity to give him the bare minimum, questioned his war strategy and his faith, and launched investigations into his finances, two of those points targeting the Duke of Buckingham personally. While the two subsidies were far less than he expected, it was enough for now. On the 9th of August, he sent a message to the Commons, essentially saying that, unless they granted him more supply immediately, the momentum of the war would be lost. He couched it in remarkably patronising terms. The longer they stayed in session, the greater the risk they would contract the plague, which had reached Oxford before Parliament had. If they didn't quickly grant him supply, quote, he will take more care of the commons than they will of themselves, end quote, 
and he would suspend the session until winter. The Commons debated the message and sent a reply, passed unanimously, which said, in the most flowery and debasing language, no. So, on the 12th of August, Charles ordered Parliament dissolved. Just to make a correction on last time's episode, I finished off saying that this Parliament lasted just a week. I think I was just confused about the adjournment, and that slipped into the script. The bill on tonnage and poundage, the one which gave the king the right to collect it for just a year, was still in the Lords. Charles collected it anyway, on his own royal prerogative, as if he had been granted it for life, as tradition demanded. Preparations for war had begun back in May, with a general muster of the militias and port garrisons ordered. The Lord Lieutenants were to make ready their forces of horse and foot, ensure they were supplied, and begin drilling them for battle. Several thousand were ordered to rendezvous at Plymouth and Hull, ready to be shipped to the continent. All of this had begun before Parliament had gathered, but now the expected funds had not appeared. Still, the die had been cast, and Charles had international commitments to meet. So in combination with a contingent of Dutch ships, the fleet was dispatched to war, under the command of Sir Edward Cecil, the nephew of the late Earl of Salisbury. Shortly before he departed, Cecil had been made Viscount Wimbledon, and although he apparently didn't make use of the title till he returned, we will call him Wimbledon. Wimbledon had been ordered to hold regular councils of war from among his captains, and to avoid unnecessary risk. He took this second instruction a bit too literally for some, after returning to port just a day after setting out, due to bad weather. Sir John Coke told him that, quote, Wars require hazard, so it be with judgment, and if the safety of your ships had been the most to be respected, the way had been to keep them at Chatham, end quote. He set out again two days later, and despite the fleet being damaged by a storm, Wimbledon reached Spanish shores safely. His orders were, in order of priority, to seize the Spanish treasure fleet, to harass other Spanish shipping, and, last of all, to capture Spanish ports. To achieve any of this would be a success, as the state of the navy was hardly inspiring. Even before the storm damage, the ships, which were mostly requisitioned merchant vessels, were in a bad shape, while the crews and soldiers were badly supplied and incredibly low on morale. The fleet anchored off the coast of Cadiz, one of the two primary Spanish ports for trade from the Americas. Unfortunately for the English, either the fleet was already safely harboured before they even left Plymouth, or the treasure fleet was still at sea, But once it was spotted, the English fleet was in no position to actually catch it. My sources are differing on that point. Wimbledon, once he reached Cadiz, called a council of war, which decided to sail to Puerto de Santa Maria, opposite the Bay of Cadiz from Cadiz proper, to resupply. No further planning was made because of the uncertainty of the situation and a lack of information. It would be a waste of time. The vice-admiral, the Earl of Essex, led the way into the bay on the 22nd of October. Instead of heading to the planned port, Essex sailed directly towards a number of unprepared Spanish vessels anchored off of the coast. These ships fled, and Essex, whose own ship had outrun the others, decided that it was too dangerous to follow them into the unknown on his lonesome. Wimbledon called another council, during which he received news from an English fisherman that Cadiz was completely unprepared for battle. This buoyed the spirits of the expedition, and some argued that the city should be assaulted immediately. But Wimbledon's orders had been clear. Avoid disaster. As a veteran of warfare in the Netherlands, he was well aware of how risky sieges were. He played it safe, and ordered the bombardment and capture of the nearby Fort Puntal. The fort held out for a day, which was long enough for Cardiz to receive reinforcements 
and it's debatable how necessary it was to actually take this fortification. By the 24th, the English force was ashore, and Wimbledon continued to play it safe. A direct assault on Cardiz was out of the question, and so he would use his superiority on land and sea to cut off the port. His soldiers would seize the bridge, which connected the city to the mainland, while the fleet would head off any supply routes by sea. It was a perfect plan. What could go wrong? Then, the expedition unwittingly set the foundations for a national stereotype many centuries in the future. As the force marched to take the bridge, they came across an abandoned house, full of barrels of wine. Against his better judgement, Wimbledon agreed that his overheated, exhausted men should refresh themselves with a little tipple. And oh dear, did they ever. And in the tradition of Englishmen visiting the south of Spain, the soldiers got trashed. They demanded more than they had originally been given, breaking into the house and collecting it themselves. They bickered and brawled, insulting their officers and the Viscount of Wimbledon himself, and lost any semblance of order. They had, in one fell swoop, ceased to be a fighting force. Wimbledon had but one option, and the belligerent drunks were cut off, herded into their taxis and sent home, or, in this case, the wine barrels were destroyed and the drunks ordered back onto their ships, which I'm sure helped with their hangovers. Not all of them made it back, however with Spanish reports recording that a relief force found over a thousand men still in the midst of a drunken stupor, at which point they were slaughtered. Even worse, the expedition still hadn't resupplied, which was their initial aim upon entering the bay, and they were almost out of fresh water. Foraging parties had been sent out while they were ashore, but many had been killed by patrolling Spaniards. Buckingham had promised a relief force, though, and so Wimbledon anchored in the bay and awaited their arrival. Before long, though, disease had begun to set in, as did the winter, and after almost a month, the assembled captains agreed that it was time to sail for home. Of course, that wasn't the end of the disaster, as a storm dispersed the fleet en route, and Wimbledon himself wouldn't make it back until the 11th of December. That was the disaster of the Cardi's expedition, and it truly was a disaster. Thousands of the combined Anglo-Dutch force were dead or captured, and dozens of ships had been lost. Buckingham had said it best when he sent Wimbledon off. I have put into your hand the first infinite trust and pawn of my goodwill that I had ever in my power to bestow. Wimbledon had taken that trust and that goodwill, and whether it was all his fault or not, thrown it away. Buckingham was Lord Admiral. Never mind that he wasn't actually in command, the book stopped with him, in the eyes of his opponents at least. I'll leave off today's episode with a quote from Kishlansky. Buckingham was faulted for everything. The ships were badly outfitted, the provisions were inadequate, the pressed soldiers were a ragtag, The commanders were inexperienced, the strategy was ill-conceived. Buckingham's true fault was failure, and his failures multiplied. Next time, we will hear what his other failures were, as Charles was forced to call, you guessed it, another parliament. As a quick reminder, I'll be at Sound Education at Boston in a few weeks' time. Come join me. Mike Duncan, Robin Pearson, Pontifact, Matt from the Explorers podcast, and so many others. It's going to be a great time. I cannot wait. The only reason I can afford to go in the first place is because of my patrons. So thank you to the peers of the realm. The Royal Headsman, executed today. Her Grace, the Duchess of Devon, Michelle Gersich. His Grace, the Duke of Clarence, Rory Martin. The Most Honourable Marchioness of Scullion, Lady Jennifer the Right Honourable Countess of Shrewsbury, Elaine Dickens, Countess of Surrey, Jean Buckley, the Earl of Oxford, Christopher Grogan, the Earl of Somerset, Brendan Bonner, the Countess of Cornwall, Belinda Clarence, the Earl of Hereford, Christopher Remo, the Earl of Dunbar, Angus Wilson, 
the Earl of Southampton, Alan Goldstein, the Earl of Northampton, Justin Drowns, the Earl of Nottingham, John Toogood, the Earl of Worcester, Alan Goldstein, Stephen, Earl of Warwick, the Earl of Bradford, Richard Liddell, the Earl of Northumberland, Michael Thomas, and the Earl of Ormond, Mark Lemke. Remember that you can join the peerage at patreon.com slash Pax Britannica, and you can follow the show on Twitter, Britannica Pax, or me personally, Samuel Hume 10. And thank you to Sounds Like an Earful for providing the music in today's episode. My entire House of Lords, and to you for listening. <laughs>